Here in the upper room, in the port of Malmesbury Abbey, far away in the north of Wiltshire, are some illuminated manuscripts drawn by monks in the 15th century. Flowers and leaves and fruit. I dare say they couldn't draw very accurately, but they liked the small flowers, the unregarded weeds we throw out of the garden. They liked them for their shape and colour. And almost everything we're going to see in this visit to Malmesbury is what has been here for centuries and will, please God, be here long after we are dead and buried. Ordinary things. Flowers and trees and streams here in the Wiltshire meadows, among small elmy hills in what's considered good hunting country. First, just soak in the atmosphere of the place. William Morris, the Victorian poet, craftsman and socialist, dreamed of just such a setting as Malmesbury has when he described medieval London in the opening lines of his poem, The Earthly Paradise. Forget six counties overhung with smoke Forget the snorting steam and piston stroke. Forget the spreading of the hideous town. Think rather of the pack horse on the down and dream of London, small and white and clean. The clear Thames bordered by its gardens green. Small and white and clean. That's what Malmesbury still is. You could throw a stone from the town down into the country where we're standing here. I don't think words are needed in a place like this. The birds are enough. Small rivers run round three sides of the town. Malmesbury is a city set on a hill. And these rivers which surround it are the beginnings of the Wiltshire Avon, which flows on to Bath and Bristol and out into the estuary of the Severn. No concrete paddling ponds for the kiddies, no litter baskets, no neat municipal flower beds, real country. Sluices, mill ponds, mill leats and clear streams. Real country laps right up to the three reedy shores of this limestone town. You wouldn't know driving through Malmesbury in a motor car what a sacred and peculiar place it is. You wouldn't know what gives it an atmosphere one can almost touch and see. But this is what does it. This is what makes Malmesbury different. It was one of the chief places of pilgrimage in the Middle Ages. Its huge Benedictine Abbey was a center of learning of European fame. And I know you haven't seen the Abbey yet, but you will. There's a sense of expectancy here, so near as though we ourselves were pilgrims from the past. The abbey was the shrine of Old Helm, the Saxon saint, and later Bishop of Sherburn. And in Malmesbury lived King Athelstan, Alfred's grandson, the first king of all England. He had a palace here a thousand years ago and was buried in the abbey. William of Malmesbury, the most famous medieval historian, was a monk here, and in the abbey there were relics of the true cross and a fragment of the crown of thorns. The abbey had 16 chapels, a west tower, and a central spire higher than that of Salisbury Cathedral. What made people go on pilgrimages in the Middle Ages by boat up the river, on foot along causeways, 
and on pack horses through Maori lanes. Partly, it was their form of holiday, like our expeditions to the Costa Brava. Partly, it was to find God. They thought of Christ very much as God made man who had walked on earth. Just as in his lifetime in Palestine, people struggled to get near him through the crowds, if only to touch the hem of his garment, so they plodded along to Malmesbury in their patterns and clogs to see the relics of his cross and thorny crown and to be near the shrines of his saints and kings. Possibly they came along this very path by Daniel's well on their way to the city set on a hill. And as they crossed the last river and reached the outskirts, they looked up and saw the end of their journey. There it is on its hill. Even today, it's very much as it was then. For Malmesbury has stayed the same size, growing neither much bigger nor smaller. The arched gateways by which you used to enter it by road have disappeared, but it's still surrounded by a skirt of old cottages whose gardens go down to the river. You can get the sense of enclosure by walking along one of these cottage gardens before you start to climb up to the abbey. It's much best done on foot like this. Treat this cottage, for instance, as though it were the city wall. And let's go through it. You can think yourselves back into the past. Here we are, entering the famous city. And now we'll start the climb to the distant sound of the abbey bells. Past limestone walls stuffed with toad flax and topped with valerian and wallflower. Up and up and up between the gardens and the houses all the time getting nearer to the end of the pilgrimage and as you reach the summit of the hill you can stop and look back and see how Malmesbury is surrounded by open country and small streams unique in southern England that's the view from the doctor's garden and his house is in the middle of the town by the way the spire you'll see coming into view above the cow parsley there isn't the abbey. It belonged to one of the parish churches. Of course, Malmesbury is a market town too and has its own old corporation and court and ancient charters and market cross and inns like this where farmers close their bargains with a drink. And there's the market cross at the end of the high street and beyond it, the abbey. Vast, isn't it? Like something in Northern France fast, isn't it? Yes, fast, wasn't it? For all that's left now of the mighty abbey is the nave, south aisle, and the south porch. And this south porch, the finest Norman porch in England, must have seemed like the gate of heaven to pilgrims after their journey over the downs and then through the forests and undrained land. Look at the carving. 12th century. Late Norman. Done when England was an island belonging to the Dukes of Normandy and Europe was known as Christendom. And over the inner door there's a carving of Christ in glory. And there's the nave of the abbey as you first see it. That's Brother Elmer a Malmesbury monk who tried to fly 900 years ago. He fixed wings to his hands and feet, jumped off a high tower, flew for a furlong, and then fell to the ground, breaking both his legs. William of Malmesbury tells the story. And it was William who must have seen those hounds and owls carved on the arches of the nave. And really, if you don't look east inside the abbey, where it's all shorn off, 
but look upwards instead and then turn west, you can get an idea of the former grandeur. Look at the slender tracery of that great west window. But here are the East End ruins. Here's where the great central tower was, standing on those arches and supporting a spire higher than that of Salisbury Cathedral. And beyond the crossing, the choir and chapels. This was the mighty beacon to pilgrims and students from all England and Europe. What faith was theirs who built such an abbey? Malmesbury, a city set on a hill which cannot be hid.